This is by uh, Rebbe Zev Van Shimon Halevi. Actually, I'm not sure he's rabbinically ordained or not. I'm not sure, but nonetheless, the work is pretty significant, and there's a lot of good stuff here. So um, one of the things that I like to do, and I know that certain uh, groups don't adhere to this, but I like to use various texts from all different types of minds and grasp all of the nuggets of knowledge we can get from them and sort of add them to our library internally. Um, and this is one of those. It's not a traditional text because it actually goes into uh, other subjects like tarot and astrology and some other things here. But I still think that they're, they're important to understand. And, um, you know, Hashem is one. He's everywhere. We can find him under, underneath uh, all of the various aspects of our reality. So we need to dig and, and learn from as many uh, sages as possible. And this is just another one of those. So... So once everybody has that, uh, we'll start. Chris, you can read the introductions on page 8. That's where we're reading from. And then, Chris, like I mentioned, I'll just, uh, or anybody, can jump in and out as we go forward from each paragraph to paragraph. And I'm, I'm uh, Chris, you're here, right? Yeah, I am. Okay, great. And you sound clear, so it's perfect. So um, if we are ready... Then Chris, start, and I'll mute out until I come in. Okay. Thanks, pal. Um, the tree of life is a picture of creation. It is an objective diagram of the principles working throughout the universe. Cast in the form of an analogic tree, it demonstrates the flow of forces from the divine to the lowest world and back again. In it are contained all the laws that govern and their interaction. It is also a comprehensive view of man. The relative universe hovers between two poles, all and nothing. Either end of this fluctuating axis may be seen as nothing or all, as both become the entry and exit points for the absolute who stands apart from creation. Here we have the full reality. All else is the ultimate observer, illusion. A cosmic drama compared and dissolved in a cyclic place within plays from the subtlest reverberations in the highest worlds to the slowest movements and changes materiality. The absolute has no direct contact with creation, yet being permeates through the matrix of the universe, supporting it like the silence behind every sound. Without this negative reality, nothing could come into existence as shadow cannot manifest without light. Here in the relative world, we move particles and waves, never for the most part suspecting that what we touch is always disappearing and what we see is really not there. Solidity is a charade, a temporary state of nothing, frozen for a time into a form that is familiar to us, who, ourselves, who are ourselves but travelers in the ever-changing scenery called Earth. Creation is separate from its creator even more than a modern production of Hamlet is far removed from Shakespeare. Yet creation hears its author's hand and through the actors may interpret, the play remains essentially as the master conceived it. The relative universe, like our analogy of a play, is constructed in the same design with protagonists and supporting cast set against a series of backgrounds in which different roles, seeking to find equilibrium, create and operate dramatic events known as evolution. The relationships between various characters or forces is very precise, though they may take up different attributes under specific conditions. This set of conditions is laid out in the tree of life so that a given situation may be examined and its participants and their true status be revealed. The tree is a model of the relative universe. It is a template of all the world, carrying within it a recurring system of order. Moreover, any complete sub-organism or organization is an imitation of its plan. Man is the prime example. He is a microcosm of the macrocosm. His being is an exact replica in every detail and miniature of the cosmos above him. True, he moves in the physical world, is made up of atoms, molecules, and cells, yet he partakes in the subtle realm of forms, can assist in conscious creation, and has access to the divine. As man is an image of creation, so creation is but a reflection of the creator. 
By this resemblance, we are able to study that which is below by looking at that which is above and that which we cannot observe by examining that which is below. Through the tree of life, we have an objective connection which gives us insight and knowledge by the principle of parallel into the upper and lower inner and outer universes. In our account, the origin of the tree of life is traced then the power of its illumination and formulation oops, following the development of its conception we see that cosmic principles apply to any whole entity observing its workings we are shown how the tree gathers an intelligible order all aspects of phenomena and demonstrates them in a reflective picture a universe wherein the creator is present even in the densest of matter Okay, so let's um, move forward past the picture here, the menorah, and go to the history too. We're just going to read some of this, but to recap, what the author is saying here in the beginning is basically that, um, again, we're looking at this fractal image of life. So it's telling us that as above, so below, as within, so without. As the tree radiates outward through the spherot, um, we're, we're going endlessly outward and endlessly inward to our very essence internally. So there are these layers that we're dealing with. Our job is to remove these layers outwardly. We're, we're trying to reveal and remove layers to the real reality that exists in the insof, in the infinite. And our job is to correct and remove the veils that hide us from this very fact, this illusion, this grand scheme that we're constantly uh, playing this role in and the tree of life itself is in fact this map. It gives us this road map of how the system works. And it's uh, discussed in Kabbalah that uh, the spherot and the tree and the parts of theme and the worlds are basically showing us exactly how the system is relating from the all and the nothing uh, all the way down to the, the finite, which is our reality here. So in essence, uh, in order for us to grasp this wisdom and attain these higher levels, we have to fully understand what the tree is trying to tell us and how to utilize it correctly, what it means and how to associate to it on varying degrees of revelation. So Chris, if you can go into history a little bit and then we'll, uh, I'll stop you as we go. Thanks. Okay. The actual origin of the tree of life is unknown. It's, it is traditionally rooted in the Kabbalah, the inner teaching of Judaism. All complete religions have two faces. The outer facet takes the form of words and public ritual, while the inner aspect is the internal, often an oral instruction, which is passed on from teacher to pupil, who face to face have a personal rapport in which the master knows what and when it can be taught to further the disciple's development. When the pupil becomes a master in his own right, he in turn imparts his own wisdom and understanding to the next generation so that without a break, a tradition may be carried on over several thousand years without a trace of its outward appearance. This oral method is common to all major religions. However, like many institutions, it is subject to decay and corruption so that from time to time in history, there is a reformulation of ancient objective principles adapted for the language and customs for the current day. It is said that Abraham, the father of the Hebrew nation, received the original teaching from Melchizedek, the king of Salem, who was also a priest of the Most High God. The name Melchizedek means king of just men, or my king is righteousness. And Salem, the ancient name for Jerusalem, means peace. This may be seen as a historical fact or allegory, for the Bible can be read as an outer or inner account of events which take, pay, which take on the form of living parables. Okay, so uh, again, we're seeing that an important point. So the manifestation of these, uh, of our reevaluation of this teaching, has spawned into various sects of religion, um, basically as it's been uh, understood through time. And we know that through time, we've had a progressively larger evolution of ego, uh, of this egoism in the general cle or the general population. So as we see, we have a pure. Just like we do spiritually, we have a pure source of the knowledge, and then we have its understanding as it's understood from an ever-increasing ego. And what that does through time is we see destruction of temples, uh, we see Jer uh, Jerusalem under attack, we see all sorts of um, changes in society, different nations, 
uh, different forms of religion, Catholicism, Christianity, Islam. Uh, we have all of these sects that spring out, and everybody sort of interprets it as, uh, in a new way as this evolution process happens. What, just like spiritually, we have a root and branch, we also see it in this world. And another example of as, as above, so below, we're noticing that there's an evolution here that we must understand and realize when we're diving into the true meanings of the text. So we have to also pierce through these veils through our own human history and grab this source that came back from the beginning and try to uh, uh, find that source again through all of the clothing that it's been given through the various religions and, and other teachings. And that was back into the days of Abraham and, and, uh, and um, the King of Peace here. So that's, what he's, that's basically what he's touching on. So go ahead, Chris. Thanks. Prior to this happening, Abraham, Abraham had come to the conclusion, after deep research in contemporary religions, that there was only one invisible living God. Now, after being initiated by Melchizedek, match of this belief was the introduction to objective knowledge and understanding that out of the creative fountainhead of God came many manifestations, and that these were not to be mistaken for the Creator. Abraham, knowing that he was known by God, made a pact with him to pass the knowledge on. This was the covenant. The Hebrews retained this understanding with their maker over many generations, though occasionally they lost sight of it when their tradition was adulterated by neighboring customs and beliefs. The essence, however, was periodically revived as when Moses dragged a half-reluctant, slave-minded people out of the symbolic as well as literal land of Egypt into a spiritual rebirth. In the desert of Sinai, a whole generation of old slave habits had to die out before a new Israel could be set on its original direction. Without okay, so doubt, just to, object sorry about that, Chris. Just to touch this is important. We look at the at the explanation of the Pharaoh and uh, Moshe trying to reunite his people and fight with the Pharaoh to escape Egypt and cross the the Sea of Reeds uh, by the splitting. And all of this is, is an analogy toward our spiritual um, endeavor that we take on. And, and, you know, we say that in the spirit there's no time. So we can uh, um, understand that today that same exodus is happening right now. It's not just a set time back then. It's actually something we need to embrace in this moment. Because if we get out of this reality, time ceases to exist, as we've been explained by num numerous uh, scientists that, the time is not there. It's, it's only here. It's our, it's our egoistic understanding that, that causes so time to break down the uh, relationship between experience and, and uh, uh, our out outward perceptions. So really all of this is happening now, and, and, and the books of the Torah are explaining this process to us. It's giving us the roadmap of, of what's going to happen. And we can necessarily see right now in our time that there is an enslavement somewhat in the people that are under the influence of the ego, and the ego breaks itself off into many different uh, degrees in this world. But under enslavement here, meaning that the ego is, is, is representative of Pharaoh that's saying that, I know, I'll give you things you need, but you're always going to do what I say. And we see that by Moshe asking to leave to go be with a God and, and him telling him, well, I'll allow it to a certain extent, but not the way you want it. So this is a negotiation with Pharaoh. Um, he's sort of Pharaoh saying, as long as it's my way, and I see the, I, I feel comfortable with it, I'll allow it. But in the end, Hashem tells him, no, it's going to be all or nothing, and we're going to fight this battle until you're completely free of it. And this is the, the Exodus. This is in, in and of itself the story of Exodus. And Pharaoh, obviously, in the end, uh, is, um, is killed off. Um, but Egypt continues. So there's, there's an interesting parallel there, and, and, the, and the depths of that can be talked about forever, but I just wanted to make that point. So, Chris, go on. Thanks. Okay. Um, the Hebrews retained this understanding with their maker over many... Okay, never mind. Without doubt, objective knowledge about the universe was held at the time of Solomon, for it is written into biblical text of the period and construction of the temple and the seven branched candlestick are both formulations of the tree of life, as were the columns Hakim and Boaz on either side of the temple veil. The physical diagram of the tree built into the temple was lost when this first temple was destroyed and the Jews taken into exile in Babylon. In Babylon, strange events occurred. 
Besides Ezekiel's resurrection of Israel's religious tradition, which urged them to return home to Jerusalem, the men responsible for the inner teaching of their religion realized that there was a unique possibility of the second rebirth of the nation. Hebrew, in the overriding presence of the vernacular used in Babylonia, had ceased to be a first language. So here was a chance to embed before it became established again as a national speech, many ideas. Make it a language that contained more than just an everyday vocabulary of meetings. At this point, we know that the actual 22 letters of the alphabet were reconstructed, changed from the ancient pictograms into a more robust alphabet known as Assyrian script. Later, long after this new Hebrew had been established, though it never took quite over from Arama Aramaic, the lingua, Franca of the Middle East, it became regarded as a holy language and like Sanskrit to be used in holy matters. One work in particular reveals the philosophical construction of the Hebrew alphabet. This was a Sefer Yetzirah, reputed to be written by Abraham, but more likely to have been drafted in the earlier centuries of the Common Era. In this, to each letter was ascribed a planet and a sign of the zodiac. Herein lies our date clue, inasmuch that the sign Libra was inserted into the zodiac circle long after Abraham died. Other qualities were attached to each letter, and the whole pivoted on a system of three creative principles embodied in air, water, and fire. Here, the various combinations of these three forces made the universe function, and numerous arrangements of letters and their corresponding numerical values described the positions and relationships evident in the macrocosm of the world and the microcosm of man. Drawing possibly from Greek sources, it also used the Pythagorean concepts of a triangle or trinity containing the ten letters relating to the name of God. Scholars disagree as to who formulated this diagram first. Okay, okay, so we see that, again, you know, this manifestation of various ideas and concepts um, through the Sefer Yetzirah and into Greek sources that, that went into the Pythagorean concepts still maintain that true root. We see that the triangle, the, the trinity went, you know, later we hear from Catholicism and Christianity about the trinity. These are all still basically the root of what Abraham was teaching. And we understand that in the days of Abraham, all of this knowledge was passed on from one to the other. So uh, whether or not he actually drafted the Sefer Yetzirah isn't really the issue. The, the more important aspect of it is the teachings go back to what that root is about. And the Sefer Yetzir attributed to Abraham because it really was that essential teaching. It went back to that essential understanding that, that they understood at that time came from the lineage of, of the Hebrews and through Abraham. Um, and so as we go through and we find out uh, and we really dig into the other religi uh, religions and their aspects of what they, how they conceive beyond the written uh, uh, topical basic understandings, we find the depths of all of it, from Greek to Roman, all the way out into the European places and into the Asian uh, communities. It's all really stemming from the same understanding, that Kabbalah, that Hermetics, under Hermetica, the, the, even later the alchemy, uh, uh, the alchemical understanding. All of it is still the root. It's still, it's still based on the same grounded concepts. And although later, as it closes uh, into a more... Uh, into the years and do a more um, explanation in, in writing, we see that they drift off a little bit in understanding, but the sources are still the same. And so as we learn and, and, and understand these various ideas, we trace them back into their core concepts, which all fall back into this main, understand, this main uh, basic understanding and, and, uh, of basically Kabbalah. So go ahead, Chris, thanks. The interchanges of objective knowledge between wise men of different nations and traditions during the few hundred years before Christ was common than is generally supposed. Intelligent men obviously met and exchanged ideas with their fellows fought, while their fellows fought over trade and politics. The Jews, though often considered a particularly insular group, were no exception as far as the perceptive thinkers amongst them were concerned. While Pythagoras traveled the Eastern Mediterranean in search of knowledge, no doubt rabbis, though not of merely learned kind, also sought wise company, even in alien cultures. In the seaport, seaport of Alexandria, founded by the Greeks, a great library devoted to the nine muses was set up. 
Here at this first museum were gathered ideas from all over the known world. To this remarkable center, one of the earlier Ptolemies invited 70 Jews so that the Hebrew books he had a respectful reports of might be translated into Greek. With these scholars, no doubt came Rabbi's verse in the Kabbalah, the inner explanation of the Bible. These men probably made connections with the inner teachings of Greek and, and Egyptian philosophy and religion, and from this cross-pollination, more discoveries were added to the distinct traditions. There is much evidence of shared ideas in Greek thought, and an uncheckable fable has it that the tarot cards, which appear in medieval times, trace back to the wall diagrams in the corridors of Egyptian temples. These cards, on close scrutiny, show more Greek and Hebraic thinking than Egyptian symbolism. The adding of new ideas and reformulating of old ones was a feature of the Kabbalist schools, and rabbis down the centuries have hammered and tested every edition before its inclusion into the body of Kabbalistic literature. The test of argument, along with the flash of enlightenment, kept a balance necessary for the narrow path of vision through the forest of illusion. For this reason, men were not allowed to study the Kabbalah until the full maturity, lest the wine of mysticism overbalance them like a drug trip to the modern young. A man had to be experienced in life, have the stability to handle and master the things of earth before he could attempt the portals of heaven. It is said by okay. some scholars... Sorry, Chris, let me jump in and just understand this. Uh, originally, and through the lineage, we see that there was a, a set understanding among the rabbis that their Talmud, their students, had to be at a certain level in order to grasp the, the higher wisdom of Kabbalah. So basically, they were asking the students to fully uh, uh, um, accept, understand, and have mastered Torah and Mitzvah, the Gemara, the, the, the Mishnah, all of these works, so that they could then base their foundation on these, uh, on this, uh, on this basic understanding, and then they can just wind and and wrap this deeper knowledge into that. It was an important part of it. We see that through the Arizal um, and through other Kabbalists uh, in more recent times that this was an important um, concept then, because then Kabbalah and the mystical teaching had to be maintained in secrecy. Um, it wasn't something that was available to all the nations, quote unquote. It had to be kept from, from teacher and student in this verbal relationship, uh, for the very fact that the whole purpose of this teaching was from Abraham all the way through to the end time, and that's what we're taught: is that that this teaching was to be kept secret and confined, and that's why up until recently, very recently, 15, 20, 30 years maybe, uh, we see that this was a very it was not known very well. It was very mystical. No one really understood it. There was a huge degree of, of misunderstanding when it came to the, the, the concepts of Kabbalah. In fact, most of the time back in, in the uh, yeah, 16th, 17th, uh, 18th centuries, we see that it was really a, um, uh, considered uh, uh, magic and, and some weird foreign kind of, of uh, 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 ritualistic understanding. And, and, and this is just normal... Uh, human behavior. When we don't understand something, we have fear of it. And when we have fear of it, we want to destroy it. Uh, we don't, <laughs> and this is how, how we see in the Roman church and, and uh, by the by burnings and by the witch trials and all these other things, that when we don't really grasp something and it isn't available to us, uh, that fear, that egoistic fear takes over and, and we want to dominate it. Um, uh, fortunately, it made its way through. And now, as we hear from uh, uh, many of the famous Kabbalistic rabbis, they tell us now it's been released for the general public, meaning that we should all embrace this so that this secret understanding, and we should all understand it now because it's important in our generation when the ego is in its biggest point, which is today. Okay, Chris, thanks. It is said by some scholars that the first writings on the Kabbalah were set down in the second century of the Common Era by people present at the discussions of Rabbi Simon ben Yohai. It is maintained by other scholars that many, if not all, the books of the Zohar commentaries were written or compiled, compiled by a 12th century Spanish Jew, Moses de Leon, whose widow claimed he wrote them to make money under the blind of being ancient works because people then, as now, like and value antiques. This is not matter. More important was that the Kabbalah emerged 
into the open, and we get in medieval Spain, which took over from the decaying authority of the Babylonian rabbinical school, the full diagram of the Tree of Life. Besides its effect on the golden Arab-Jewish era in Spain, the Kabbalah and its ideas had a powerful influence on Christendom. The church was at the point in need of reassurance for its more intelligent clergy who were being disturbed by the quality of ideas coming from Muslim and Jewish universities who were consequently finding the faith was not enough. Helped by others, Thomas Aquinas, the Catholic scholar, found the solution in the study of Judaism, which composed the Kabbalistic work of Dionysus, the Arpagit, with that of Aristotle. Out of this, he was able to formulate a whole theology, which was later to be grafted into church teaching. Contrary to the Platonic Christians, he brought the abstract universe into the mundane, relating God and angelic influences through the tree of life into the world of elements, plants, animals, and men. Out of this Kabbalistic concept came the nine orders of the church hierarchy. Even the great cathedral builders were influenced. Erected by the Masons, who based their ideas on the Temple of Solomon, the west front of each church had two towers, representing the twin columns on either side of the temple veil. Here were the outer columns of the Tree of Life, the masculine and feminine aspects, the active and passive forces flowing down from heaven. Called in Chatra's Cathedral, the Sun and Moon Towers, this idea is repeated in later centuries through the sources though the source, is, the source is forgotten. Another concept is the Holy Trinity of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost with the Kabbalistic bride represented in the Rose of Submission. Looked at with many knowing eye, many cathedral plans take on a new meaning. Okay, so just Wait, to move back to time. this... Oh, I'm sorry, Chris, did you hear me? Okay, just to move back to the, to the image that we just passed by here on this uh, page 17 in, in the PDF. We can see the basic tree. Uh, the circle there at the top is the Ash right under Keter. So we see that, that uh, manifestation of the kind of missing spherot there. And then we see some uh, terms here that we won't go into too much, but we see the angelic seraphim, the harabim, the dominations, thrones, principalities, virtues, archangels. Now these are known also as uh, the cloaks or the robes. There's all sorts of different uh, terms applied here, and we also know that they're also, uh, or more commonly understood, as the spherot of uh, Keter, Hakma, Bina, Zeran, Pen, and on and on. So this is the formation. We have this spherot on both columns and in the central column, and then we have pathways that connect the various spherot. So what we're going to try to do through this work, and what we're going to jump a little bit, is to understand what, what is this? actually mean to me? How, how do I utilize this and why is this so important that it's been passed down for so long uh, and, and, and kept so secret so that we could have it today? There has to be because of the thousands of, re of, of religions and, and mystical teachings some incredible significance to this because we see through human history that when something is not relevant or, or has little meaning it gets discarded, it gets lost and it's, not, and, and it's very hard to find a reason to keep it uh, consistent throughout uh, the history. This, on the other hand, has been uh, immensely protected and completely hidden away so that it could be revealed to us. So that in and of itself, just by the sheer volumes of work, of texts, of understanding that have been passed along through the, the thousands of years, um, we can tell that this is extremely important. And there's something very, very vital in this that we have to grasp, that we need to understand. It's almost smacking us in the face to tell us pay attention, this is you, this is life, this is the connection to the eternal, and you need to understand. So relating to the tree is, is, is important, and we're going to try to t tackle these pathways and what does Firot mean and how the pathways work and, and how the tree itself relates uh, in this, inf in this uh, role of infinity between the all uh, and, the, and the finite. And so as we can see, um, and, and we'll go on in one second, but I want to make a mention here that these pathways between the spherot um, are to be understood on the micro and macrocosm. So we see them outward in the spiritual universes, and we also have them internally. So they relate to us uh, in, our, in our thoughts, actions, 
and our speech, or, I'm sorry, our thoughts, emotions, and speech, and they also relate outwardly to the external manifestation. So there's huge degrees of understanding this, and really to tackle this is an important aspect of learning Kabbalah. Without this, it it's, it's, will be lost. Um, one of the things when we talk about the pathways to understand is that when we see we have two spherot connected by one pathway, the pathway are always considered subtle. They're always considered um, to be like sh a shaft in the wind. They blow like the, like the, the reeds, um, drawn back and forth through this energetic influence from the two spherot that connect to them. So, uh, for example, when you have a positive and negative, you have this neutral, the neutral sort of that pathway. So when one positive draws from the other, one spherot drawing from the other, the channel is that connection between the two that, that uh, we can see as a flash of lightning or, that, or that, uh, that energy of Hashem. So just wanted to make that point, and you can go on. Okay. By Renaissance times, the Kabbalah and the Tree of Life were known to many scholars. The Zohar, with its complex studies on the Bible, numerology, angels, and the nature of man, and many other allied subjects, has been printed, and gentle scholars, Gentile scholars took much interest, partly to relate it with the knowledge of coming in from the Byzantine world, and partly because of its relationship with magic. This application of the Kabbalah brought it into much disrepute, even amongst the Jews themselves, for it gave rise to occasional mass psychosis and outlandish movements in certain northern European Jewish communities who desperately needed some mystical straw to hang on to during the recurrent waves of persecution. This magical side, mostly misunderstood or fractionally digested, both fascinated and repulsed men who came in contact with the Kabbalah. To the genuine scholar and philosopher, it was Jacob's Ladder up to heaven, a method of study the basis of a righteous code and a point of reference upon which to relate contemporary art and science. To the charlatan and the aspiring professional messiah, it was a magical weapon to cajole, frighten, and fascinate individuals and groups. Like 20th century technology, it could be made to work for or against man, lifting him out of the mire of drudgery or destroying his soul and body. At one end of the scale, Kabbalists discuss the nature of the universe, with Pico de Mirandola, brilliant light of the Medici court. At the other end, Kabbalistic amulets were sold off to keep off evil spirits or to injure enemies. Popular Kabbalism reached its height in the 17th and 18th centuries with a survey of messiahs and mystics, all of whom, except one, disappointed their followers. This one saint, Israel Baal Shem, a natural mystic, was the focus of the Jewish revival movement called the Hasidim, who flourished to this day. However, much of the capitalism was based on visions and wonder working. And while Judaism received a much needed impetus, the movement was more related to the parallel revivalism then going on in Christendom than to philosophy. Hasidism thrived, though not without resistance from the Orthodox rabbis, even to the point of Bel Shem's excommunication. In time, this great thrust of energy lost force and became formalized and institutionalized by custom rather than by spontaneous conviction. However, the so-called Kabbalistic practices still continued so that even amongst the 19th century, Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe to the West, there were to be found Kabbalists who would make charms to offset the evil eye. Okay, so this is, um, we talked about this yesterday uh, to a certain extent, and we also posted a great video Philippe put up about the uh, background on the Hasidic movement and the Bel Shem Tov and all of this, uh, this sort of, uh, some great stories and, and, and the history of what happened there. And we can see that even the, the Zadok Bel Shem Tov in, in, his, in, his, in his holiness was excommunicated at some point by the Orthodox rabbis. So uh, later, obviously, now we, we look back with great admiration toward him and everything he did and all of his work. He was a, uh, uh, the supernal heights is where he sat. So um, at the time, though, we see that it was completely still misunderstood. And this is because the actual understanding of Kabbalah was still in bits and pieces. It was still uh, sects of it and, and, and uh, misunderstandings of it, and, and it was still considered secret. So it was still head, held tightly between uh, master and student in small groups only. So as little parts came out, 
um, they were entirely misunderstood and, and taken the wrong way. Some were run off and used for profit, and some were run off and used for, for all sorts of ritualistic uh, uses. And, and this sort of made uh, not only the Orthodox rabbis, but the church and everybody else very concerned, because um, I think on some level they saw this as being a, a total misuse, uh, or, or at, at the very least a complete misunderstanding, and, and that, again, made them uh, uh, worried, and so they tried to suppress it completely. And in fact, you know, people died over it. So we're seeing that um, in an effort to uh, revitalize it and bring it out in the right way, it's taken hundreds of years to progress and eventually be held to the point where today we're seeing all the revelation of what it truly means, the process of it, how, to be, how, it, how can, it can be utilized in our lives uh, for our connection with, with the light. Uh, uh, the or Elion and, and, to, and to really help us uh, r you know make that connection between the infinite and our, our normal uh, everyday static lives here so thanks Chris go on All right. this degeneracy of outer capitalism did not however hinder the researches of thoughtful Jews and Gentiles Work was still carried out whenever the Kabbalah and Tree of Life were intelligently considered. Most of this effort was of scholarship, a blend of the intellectual detective with a dash of hope that some key might unlock the myth. Many books were written and ideas developed, but none of the quality of the Middle Ages and earlier. The 17th century produced many speculative contributions, but by the 19th century, the natural sciences had begun to interest thinkers more than mysticism. In the 19th century in the West, various semi-religious movements composed of people disappointed in materialism and their own former religion arose. These groups also included the Jews who felt that orthodox, orthodox Judaism did not fulfill their philosophical needs. Rabbinical discussion had become more learned argument. There was no longer spontaneous wisdom and understanding or real interest in their inner meaning of Judaism, especially when Jewish intelligence became involved with the concept of Zionism. Okay, so again, we can just see that, that we see a huge moving from one side, which was back in the days of Abraham Avinu, which, which was just based on this uh, deep wisdom and knowledge and understanding of the connection with Hashem. It's almost fluid. They just knew it. They had it. They were completely united in this peaceful, loving relationship. And that's very much right-sided. In fact, Abraham is related to Hesed on the, on the tree of life in the Sfirot of Hesed, and that's loving kindness. And then as we see, as time goes on, um, through science and through evolution of our ego, we move completely away from this wisdom, and we go to the left side, this egoistic side, uh, of the tree, where we're looking at it now as I need to have immediate attainment in my mind. Forget my heart. Forget the other aspects of my of my relationship. I want to know and I want to understand and calculate here in this world. And we've cut off that knowing, that wisdom that's been separated from us. And because of that very fact, because of the growing egoism there, because of our need to refuse this, w this wisdom and push away Hashem, and in order to be here and now, and we want to understand the reality around us only, that that in and of itself locks us away from that wisdom. So in a way, as we move that way through science and through technical understanding, we actually lock more gates uh, uh, from the real wisdom. We actually hinder ourselves, and we have to realize what's happening. And if we look over the history, we can see it's very clear that the more we get in touch with the now, the world, and the things of the world, the more the heavens uh, get, get cut off from us. And, and we need to be uh, wise here and understand and, and see humanity as a whole and realize, ah, this is uh, easy to see what's happening, and, and we need to correct that. We need to see that there's a much higher wisdom for us, but that wisdom is cut because of our own uh, relationship uh, with this balance. Okay, thanks. We'll just go a little bit more here, and then I want to jump. All right. Gradually, the objective of Jerusalem shifted from the spiritual to the practical, and politics took over from polemics. Zion, the yearned-for home of the exile, changed 
from man seeking to regain Eden into the reinstatement of a nation in Palestine. At the present time, Judaism, like all former religion, is losing its hold on the younger generation. However, this does not mean our time is ir irreligious. Far from it. Many of the young are seriously looking for meaning in a complex and conflicting world situation. Many people are at this moment involved in seeking out the truth through drugs, and others belong to esoteric groups studying numerous systems and methods. Many of these organizations are based on the Oriental approach and are sometimes quite alien to the Western temperament. While it is argued that these give a fresh outlooks, outlook, the effects of this adulteration occasionally divide a man, creating spiritual conflict. One cannot mix traditions and cultural temperaments so easily. Every philosophy and religion is peculiar to its own place. Moreover, the English hippie in Kathmandu is halfway between not only East and West, but ancient and modern times. Here lies a dangerous limbo so often entered by quite sincere people. In the West, we have our own traditions, just as old as the East and is well tried. Capitalism is one of them and an integral part of the Judaic Greco Christian tradition of Europe. This then is our brief. The tree of life, as the name implies, is concerned with the living word. It exists now in the twentieth century as well as in eternity. Our task is to be is to transcribe the tree into modern idiom so that it becomes manifest for us and others. Unless the top Sephira of Keter is connected with the bottom Sephira of Mahut, the tree of life is incomplete and heaven cannot reach earth. Okay, so if we go to the next page, and just to touch on, on that brilliant point, um, a, as we, we see the ego in the historical view of man from the, from the first times that we started to struggle with this, uh, or, or we actually had access to this knowledge, to the times where we struggled with it, uh, the uh, evolution of the ego and the causing of, of uh, divisions and wars and strife all the way to our time is now conning, uh, like a rubber band causing a, a reflex to jump back toward the original. So as we dive down and the stress becomes greater and greater from the, the all, the infinite and the, the uh, static, the, the um, temporal here, we see that as we draw away it's in fact pulling us back through. So as we do this huge uh, oval loop, we're now slingshotting back toward uh, spiritual understanding, and we can see it uh, throughout uh, the the world. Everyone is trying to to come back and and reconnect with this. So our task now is to understand uh, from a from a humble viewpoint exactly what happened and exactly how we became so distant from this. Uh, incredible loving relationship uh, of the eternal that that caused us to have this great wisdom and and what caused us to have this separation why it happened and how we can rectify it and this is actually um, what Kabbalah is based on and, and and it's not based on what they needed to know so much then it was it was passed along because the great sages knew we would need it now more than they needed it in a way that that they saw the evolution of man that they knew because of this great wisdom the evolution that man would take in this egoism and and they realized that today it would be more most important so that was the essence of carrying it through these small groups and these great sages of the past holding on to it clinching to it and 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 using their lives to make sure that we got it today was also that we would have the ability to to grab it now when we really looked in the worst of times and said you know I'm so far removed from this connection I I'm so lacking and and suffering in my connection and my need to be back in this state of knowing that that I need help and this help shows up in perfect form because of their actions so when we go to this uh, page 21 we see the negative existence and uh, this is the start of, of the concentric circles of Kabbalah, and this is the three foundations that the Rebbe will go into here and, and, and we'll, we'll grasp as we go forward. And this is starting to explain to us, you know, show me the map here and how this works. Let, let's dig down into the, the tree, but let's do it first from the, the kind of overall view. And in the overall view, we have the Ain, we have the Ain Sof, and we have the Ain Sof War. So we have the, the limitless, uh, the limitless, the endless essence and then we have the light 
of the endless or the infinite. So there's sort of three stages here, and it's really very hard to speak about these because we're really so far removed from this right now that we can't grasp it, but it's basically that we have an essence. We have the infinite, the God, Hashem. We always refer to as God, but it's really just the infinite wisdom of the universe that somehow is uh, far too great for our minds to really grasp at this point. And then we have the infinite's essence and then the infinite's light. So the only way we can really get to know the infinite is through what they say in the Torah, through his actions. So I really can't grasp with my mind and my calculating mind, especially in the uh, uh, degraded form it is today, how this great eternal body thinks and acts at all. But I can tell, based on my own internal revelation of this acting force, this light, uh, I can slowly learn about it. Okay, so in other words, if I'm sitting next to someone on a park bench uh, there, and I have never met this person, the only way I can explain the person to someone who asks me about them is to describe what I can feel from their actions, their clothing, their look, and I can only give them a real rough idea of this being. There's no way I could tell them about the depths of their, of their essence. This is impossible. As I start to talk and interact with this person and observe this person, I slowly get to know them better and better, and I can give a better idea of what this person is really about, and I can feel what this person is about inside. So as I build a further relationship and I spend more time and I spend more uh, uh, interaction with this person, I get to know them better and better. And in the same way, uh, although I'll never fully know their essence, I will get to know them more and more by their actions and by their interactions with me. And this is the same type of relationship that we're going to have with the light. This is why we always talk about the Kli and the Or, the vessel and the light, and how they interact together. I have to, in order to grasp the higher wisdom, remove those veils. I have to interact with this light, and I have to get to know it better through its actions. And this is the start of understanding the Tree of Life. So uh, he's going to go into a little bit here about these three concepts, the insof, the insof, or uh, in, the, in the infinite, the, the ain, the endless, the end, um, and we're going to talk about how this, the limitless works here, and then we're going to jump a little bit and talk about the relationships between the spherot on a practical level. We're going to sort of see, although they happen in a micro and macrocosm, the first levels of action in our world, and we're going to relate them uh, to that, and, and it's a very interesting uh, text that he, that he writes about here. So. Uh, Chris, if you can start here, at uh, there is an absolute, and then I'll, I'll jump in. Thank you.